Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Is my voice clear to everybody? In the back? Okay, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salamu ala rahmatin lil alameen, wa man tabiyadinahu bil ihsan ila yawmidin. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending his peace and blessings of one, upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all those who follow his way with righteousness until the last day. Before we begin, I'd just like to give you all a taster of what we are going to discuss today. We have a three-part program, inshallah. The first act, act one of tonight's lecture, will focus on the virtues of salah and two stories which will show us that to people before us, salah had a very different meaning than it does to us. Act two, we will look on what went wrong. Why is it that today, we don't approach the Salah the way the people before us did. With Act 3, we will focus on four major ways in which we can improve the quality and the enjoyment which we feel and which we experience in our Salah. Because Salah is not meant to be a ritual. In fact, none of the acts of Ibadah in Islam are meant to be rituals. If you look at the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he talks about salah. In a very interesting hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, and this hadith is sometimes awkward to quote, he said that of the things of this world that I love most are women and horses. Right? That's what awkward for some people to quote. Of the things of this world which I love most are women, referring to his wives and horses. But the coolness of my eyes is in salah. Now let's look at this hadith in a context. Horses equals transportation, which in modern terms we'd say refers to cars. Right? So for an average man nowadays, the things of this world which he loves the most would be his wife and his car. Am I right? These are things which men love. And when we make dua for our spouses and children, the dua mentioned in the Quran is that we make dua that they, are, that they become the coolness of our eyes. But Rasulullah is saying that despite the fact that he's a man and that he's a human, he's, he finds his coolness of his eyes not to be in the wife or the car or in the children, but in salah. Meaning that he loves salah, he enjoys salah even more than having a new car, even more than spending time with your spouse. That's the level of enjoyment which he gets from praying salah. So we need to ask ourselves the question, why don't we get that enjoyment from Salah? In fact, let's face it, especially for young people nowadays, Salah is a burden, right? To get someone out of bed to pray their Salah Fajr time, for many of them it's a burden. They don't know why. And many of us can't explain to them why. How is it that people before us, it was enjoyment? And for us, it's something which we just want to get over with. And if you look in the Quran about the importance of Salah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Mu'minun the qualities of the successful believer. He begins with salah and he ends with salah. Qad aflah al-mu'minun. Believers will be successful when al-lazina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. When they have khushu in their salah. Can anybody tell me what is khushu? Anyone knows what's khushu? Khushu is a sense of peace. To feel at peace. Meaning that when you are in your salah, that's the time when you feel at peace. Right? That's a quality of a successful believer. How do we get that? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues then with the qualities of the successful believer, what is the last quality? Those who preserve their salah, they pray all of their salah on time. Right? So he begins mentioning salah and he ends mentioning salah, showing us that salah is the most important quality of a successful believer. And when it comes to seeking help, most of us when we have a problem, we call our friends, we get in touch with our contacts, we, you know, we do whatever we can. And last resort, we make dua. How many of us when we have a problem, we pray salah? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about problems in the Quran, twice in Surah Baqarah he says, Istainu bi sabri wa salah. Seek your assistance with patience and with salah. How many of us use salah as a methodology of seeking 
assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings me to the first story I want to mention. And that story is the story of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam as mentioned in Sahih Muslim. In Sahih Muslim there is a story of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam when his wife Sarah was captured by a king. I'm not too sure how familiar everybody is with this story. Just a quick background. Ibrahim alayhi salam was the only believer in his city. His father was an idol maker. The majority of people in his city worshipped idols. He had to flee the city, he had to make hijrah. So he and his wife Sarah were traveling from place to place looking for somewhere where they could stay and be at peace. And they came to a country which had an oppressive king. And this king wanted to kidnap his wife Sarah and keep her as his personal slave. Right? He wanted to use her because she was beautiful. So when the gods came and took Sarah away, as mentioned in Sahih Muslim, very interesting, Rasulullah said, when Sarah was taken away, Ibrahim salam started praying salah. That's it. He started praying salah. And according to some of the narrations, when she came back after the whole issue, she went to the king and the king tried to grab her and his hand got paralyzed. Then he told her to make dua for him. She made dua, his hand came right. This happened a few times. She said, he said that she must be possessed by a jinn or must be something wrong with her and he chased her away. So when she came back, according to some of the narrations, he was still praying salah. So what was Ibrahim alayhi salam doing? Istainu bi salah. He was seeking assistance through salah. You see the difference between us and him? If it was us, what would we have done? <coughs> the average person would have went to the king to speak to him, right? Or went in the city looking for somebody to help us. Or last resort, we might make dua. How many of us would make salah? And if you're an action hero, <coughs> then you might have just come into the window with a machine gun for the king, right? But Ibrahim alayhi salam, salah. So the reason for mentioning the story is very simple. To the prophets, they literally would seek assistance through salah. When things go wrong, they would pray salah. When things were right, they'd still pray salah. And their salah was not like our salah. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to pray the hajjud, qiyamul layl, when he was in sajda, sometimes his wife Aisha, radiallahu anha, she would have to reach out and touch his legs to see if he's still alive. Because he should spend such a long time in sajda. Now I want everybody to think about this. What could he have possibly be doing in sajda for so long? What do we do in sajda? Asking for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness. But what do we normally do in sajda, the average person? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, three times, right? How many times can you keep saying Subhana Rabbi al-A'la? What, what was he doing in the sajda for so long? We'll come to that later in the lecture. Right? We're going to discuss sajda in details later in the lecture. But these stories is just to give us an understanding that salah to them was something different. It's not what it is to us. Salah was something very different. The other story I wanted to mention was about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, during the early years of Islam, he was one of the first converts to Islam. Right? He was, according to many of the scholars, the first man to accept Islam. Not the first person, Khadija radiallahu anhu was the first person, but the first man. And he was under a lot of pressure and oppression from the people of Makkah, so he said he's going to make hijrah. He's going to move to another city. He decided to move to another city. On his way out, he met a man named Ibn Duhunna who convinced him to go back to Makkah under his protection. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. When Abu Bakr came back to Makkah, the people made a condition. The people of Makkah made a condition. They said, we will only accept Abu Bakr to live in Makkah with one condition. The condition is that he does not pray salah in public. Think about that. They didn't say he mustn't do da'wah. He mustn't teach the Qur'an. He mustn't call the people towards Islam. Just don't pray your salah in public. You can pray salah in your house, but not in public. Why? Why would they say that? Well, the story continues. Abu Bakr had a loophole in that contract. He prayed salah in his garden, where people could still see him. And when he prayed his salah, whenever he would pray the salah, he would cry. Why would he cry? Because he understood the Qur'an. And when you understand the Qur'an, 
the salah is very different from someone who does not understand the Quran. So Abu Bakr would stand there praying and crying. And the non-Muslim men and women and children will gather around and watch him. And they had to be affected by his salah. And his salah was a bigger dawah to the people than our preaching. His salah was a better dawah than our lectures and our debates. People were converting to Islam because of what they saw in the salah of Abu Bakr. Until the Quraysh had to make a condition that you must pray your salah inside your house, not in your garden. Now we look at these stories, what do we realize? We realize that for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for Ibrahim alayhi salam, <clears throat> for all of the early generations, salah was something different. You can definitely see this is something different. I mean, how many of us can say when we prayed salah, it affected us, even on affecting somebody watching us? You see? Well, you see what I'm talking about? This is something different. There's something that they did that we don't do. There's something which they understood, which we haven't understood. And that's what we're going to get at today. We're going to get at how do we get that experience in our salah? How do we find enjoyment in the salah? How does the salah move from being a ritual which we do because we're told to do it to something that we do because we love Allah and we find joy in salah? And that brings us to act two, to part two of this lecture, which is what went wrong? What went wrong that we don't understand this? What went wrong that our generations, we don't know about this? We don't get this in our salah. Many of us don't even know we're supposed to get this in the salah. Many of us don't even know that our salah is supposed to have this effect on us. What went wrong? I'll give you a moment, a moment to think about that. And if anyone's got any uh, theories as to what went wrong, feel free to raise your hand and submit it. But... Uh, from my side, I can think of two main issues which cause things to go wrong. And the first is a ritual blind following of the religion. That for our generations, we have turned Islam into a bunch of rituals which we are taught by our parents, who were taught by their parents, who were taught by their parents without any explanation. Right? I mean, how many of us here have taught our children why they pray salah? You know, we pray without knowing why we pray. We fast without knowing what's the purpose of fasting. And that's why our fasting does not have the effect on us it's supposed to have. Allah tells us in the Quran that fasting is supposed to increase us in taqwa. But when we fast, we have a five-course meal for seri, right? And then we sleep half the morning. And then, if you're a guy, you play video games for the next three hours. And you look on the watch till three hours left to iftar, let's watch Lord of the Rings, that will kill three hours. Right? Then we have a five-course meal for iftar, and then we are burping throughout the tarawih, unable to pay any attention. And then, second dinner after tarawih. Right? And we wonder, hey, this fasting didn't have any spiritual effect on me. Because we're not fasting. That is not fasting. That's not what Rasulullah Sallallahu said. Rasulullah Sallallahu told us that the barakah is in a light suhoor. The barakah is having a light seri. He would just have dates and water. We want to have our omelet and a, you know, we eat more in Ramadan for one meal than we do outside of Ramadan. Think about it. Normally outside of Ramadan, you wake up in the morning, maybe you'll have one egg and a cup of tea. In Ramadan, in Suhur time, you want three eggs. Right? Why? Right? So why do we do this? Because we don't know why we fast. If you don't know why you fast, you won't fast the proper way. It's the same with the salah. We don't know why we pray salah, so we just get up there, we fold our hands, we go up and down, do the motions, and we go, and it had zero effect on us. So we find people who pray five times a day, but they get back home and they beat up their wives. Why? Because they're not praying properly. They're not praying salah the way they're supposed to pray the salah, because we haven't understood this. So our first issue as a community is that we have turned this religion into a bunch of rituals that we blindly follow. I mean, think about this. Think about the syllabus which we teach our children. We teach them how to pray. We teach them to recite the duas. We teach them to recite the surahs. We beat them up to learn hifz and to become hafiz of the Quran. This happens in our community. We beat them up to become hafiz. Unfortunately, I completely disagree with that, but that's what happens. But whoever taught them to understand the Quran? Leave them to understand the Quran, to understand the message of the Quran. 
you know, I had a program for young boys about a month ago, almost two months ago, yes. And we did a lecture called, What Does Islam Mean to You? And for most of the boys, it said, they told me that it was for the first time in their life, they actually learned what Islam is. And these are all from Muslim homes. All from Muslim homes. But it was the first time in their life that someone is explaining to them what does the word Islam mean and how should it impact my life and what role should it play in my life. Instead of just saying we Muslims because we're born Muslims. I always tell people who say that if you were born into a Christian family, would you still be a Christian? If you're born into a Hindu family, would you still be a Hindu? Are we Muslims because we're born Muslims? Or are we Muslims because we're convinced about Islam? As long as we are doing a ritual blind following, we will remain in the first category and we will not benefit from Islam. So this is a problem that we have this ritual blind following and this is why the children and the youth are not interested in practicing Islam because they are growing up in a community and in an environment which teaches them to ask questions, which teaches them not to follow something which you don't understand. Right? This is what the universities teach them. And so when they come home and they ask you, why do we need to pray salah? What's your answer? A slap in the face. Right? That doesn't work. Let me tell you a story which will wake us up for this issue. There's a youngster whose friend came to me and told me that my friend is a Hafiz al Quran. And he is the leader of the MSA of his university. But he confessed to me that he is an atheist. And his parents don't know. He confessed that he is an atheist and his parents don't know. Why is he an atheist? Because his parents sent him to the madrasa where they beat him up to memorize the Quran and nobody taught him what the Quran means. He says, what kind of a religion beats up children to memorize a book which they don't understand? So because of that, he believed that Islam is not the true religion. And he said whenever he asked these questions, Nobody answered his questions. I met another sister from Durban who is no longer a Muslim. And she told me it's because when she was a child and whenever she asked her mother questions about Islam, her mother said, don't ask questions like that, otherwise you become a kafir. That was the mother's answer. She's not a Muslim anymore. So this is a serious issue. If we want to keep our youth, we have to understand our religion. We have to understand why we do what we do. Because everything in Islam has hikmah, it has wisdom. Allah did not just reveal a bunch of rituals because he wants to watch us go up and down. No, everything in our sharia has a purpose. The sharia itself has a purpose. There's an entire science thought about Islam called maqasidu sharia, the purpose and the goals of the sharia. In our country, many people don't even know that the science exists. Let's see, we don't even know this field exists and the studying this field and teaching it to the youth is crucial for helping them in maintain the Iman. But we don't know this. So we need to move away from a ritual blind following to a pe group of people who understand Islam and who follow Islam because we understand it. And let's face it, when you understand something, your following will be on a higher level. So that's the first issue is with blind following. The second issue which stems from the first one is our education system. And I mentioned this. Our education system, think about it. At what age do we teach our children what is the meaning of Islam? At what age do we teach our children what are the benefits of Salah? No age, right? At what age do we teach our children how to answer the atheist professors at university? Not just at university anymore. I know a Muslim high school where the Hindu science teacher told the boys that there's no such thing as God. Muslim high school. Right? You're dealing with these things every day. We don't have the answers. Our education system is not preparing the youth on how to deal with modern issues. And so a youngster comes to their mother and father and says, why must I wake up at 4 a.m. to pray salah? And the mother says, because you have to. That will work with a 5-year-old, but not with a 15-year-old. You have to explain to him the benefits of the Salah. How the Salah will make a difference to his life. The positive impact it will have on his life. Let him realize that Salah is not for anyone else's benefit except his own benefit. 
But if we don't know it ourselves, how are we going to teach it to our children? So our education system needs to be revamped. We need to focus on the whys. Right? We don't need to shun these questions. We need to bring these questions in and answer them. Because the answers are there. The answers are there. Even in the Quran, Allah tells us, Inna salata tanhani al-fahshai munkar Salah stops you from saying and doing evil things. He's giving us a reason to pray salah. He says, fast la'allakum tattaqun, so that you can grow in your taqwa. He's giving us a reason for the fasting, a wisdom behind the fasting. But if we don't know this, we can't teach this. And that's why many of us find our salah is empty. You know, we pray salah, but our mind is in the kitchen. Our mind is on the TVs. Our mind is on our movies. Our mind is on our business. Our mind is on everything else. Because we don't have the tools, the necessary knowledge to understand the salah. So our education system needs to be revamped. Yes, we need to teach our children that they do us. And we need to teach them the surah and the salah and all the rituals. But with that, teach them the understanding. Teach them the meaning. Teach them the wisdoms. So they grow up following a religion which they understand. And you will see a big difference in the lives of those you to understand Islam from those who do not. So these are the two main reasons why I believe that we don't understand Salah the way it should be understood and we don't pray it the way it should be prayed. Uh, does anybody have anything else to contribute to that? And don't be afraid. I don't bite. Right? South Africa, we've got another issue with our education system. We don't ask questions. Why? Allah commands us in the Quran. Fas'alu ahli zikr. Fas'alu ahli zikr. Ask the people of knowledge in kuntum la ta'alamun if you don't know. It's a command. If you don't know something, it's compulsory to ask. Right? Rasulullah said that in asking is cure for ignorance. Right? So, questions, comments, contributions, this is part of our deen. This is not a one-sided show where someone comes and speaks and everybody else sits quietly. Feel free to comment. Right? And if you disagree with anything, feel free to say so. I don't mind. So these are some of the issues affecting our community. And if there's nothing else to contribute to that, then we can move on to the main event. Four things which completely in my life changed Salah for me and transformed Salah for me and which I hope will be able to transform the Salah for you. Before I say that, I need to mention that these are not the only four things which affect the Salah and can make it better, right? There are many ways to improve the quality of your Salah. I'm just focusing on four, so it's something practical which you can take home and give it a try, inshallah, right? So, point number one, if you want to improve the quality of your Salah and the enjoyment of your Salah, then take time every day to clarify your intention and to pray Salah slowly. Time yourself. Do this, time yourself. Two raka of salah should take you four minutes. Not one minute. Right? Time yourself. Let's discipline ourselves. Because really, Islam is about self-discipline. Islam is about self-purification. We have to do this to ourselves. Tell yourself that when I go and pray Isha tonight, I'm not going to read Surah Kosar first raka and Kullah uh, second raka. Right? I'm not saying anything wrong with that. But let's break away from being a ritual. When you recite the same surah every single salah, it becomes a ritual. Right? It becomes just a ritual. One of the best ways to increase concentration, well, create a variety. Every day, different surahs. So go home, and for Isha, recite something else. And immediately you will find your concentration will increase because you're reciting a surah which you're afraid you might have forgotten one or two of the verses. Right? It might be the simplest of surahs, but you think it yourself, I hope I never forget it, I hope I never forget it, it's going to be so embarrassing if I forgot it. Right? So immediately your concentration is there. So discipline ourselves, time ourselves. Right? Two raka, four minutes, try to do it. Maybe you'll get three minutes, inshallah, time yourself again next time. Because what you are doing now is you are disciplining yourself. That I'm not going to rush my salah. Create an environment. Create an environment for salah. Where there's no distractions. Right, one of the hadiths of Rasulullah he was praying salah and there was a curtain with some pictures on it. And he told Aisha that he had to move it because it was distracting him from his salah. So from there we will take a lesson to remove any distractions from our salah. Now sometimes distractions are impossible to move. 
you are working, you are taking a 5 minute break to pray Zuhur Salah. It's very difficult to remove the distractions. So then you have to do a psychological blockout. Right? You just have to use your mind and say, I'm concentrating on my Salah and nothing else. You got children at home running around, jumping in your back. Right? It's difficult to concentrate. Islam gives us leeway there. You're allowed to carry a child and pray. You're allowed to. Rasulullah Sallam would carry a child and pray. How many of us know this? That you can carry your child while praying Salah. I just came back from Umrah and I took two, a two-year-old and a one-year-old with me. I had to pray every Salah with a child in my hands. And my wife had to pray every Salah with, her, with the other child in her hands. Right? And if you did that in South Africa, a lot of people would say, Haram! Your Salah is broken. Rasulullah Sallam himself did that. And, the, and his wives used to do that. And the Sahaba used to do that. Right? Islam is not a religion that's that uh, aggressively strict. There is leeway when there's children. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was in sajda, if a child got on his back, he would not get up from the sajda until the child finished enjoying riding his back. Right? When he gave the Juma khutbah, he once stopped the Juma khutbah to get down and pick up a child and carry the child. Right? Very different from our masjids nowadays. You know, I brought my kids back home and my two-year-old son wants to come with me to the masjid. Because in Makkah and Medina, we used to go for salah together, for all five salah. And in South Africa masjids, it's haram for a child to go to the masjid until they're seven years old. Every masjid got a big sign. Children under the age of seven are banned. Right? We got the sign in the masjids. Rasulullah Sallallahu time, he would shorten the salah because he could hear a baby crying. Once in the masjid, a child started crying in right here. What do you think happened? The muazin stood up and said, Whoever brought that child to the masjid, I'm going to slap the father. This is what he said in front of the entire masjid. What's the difference? Where's the sunnah gone? Seriously, where's the sunnah gone in our lives? What has happened to our masjids? Complete opposite of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And how do I explain to my two-year-old that in Makkah and Medina he can come with me to the masjid and the men are kissing him and giving him sweets and shaking his hands. And if I take him to the masjid in South Africa, they're going to make him pee his pants. Right? How do you explain this to a two-year-old, the difference between the two? Because he can't understand it. Why are the masjid so different? So this is something we need to focus on. So let's take the time to clarify our intentions and to focus and discipline our salah. Step number two, and this is a major step. If you want to improve the quality of your salah, then you need to understand what you are saying. Let's go to the Quran, the verse about drinking, the verse about intoxication. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, O you who believe, do not come to salah while you are drunk until you understand what you are reciting. How many of us understand what we are reciting? So what's the difference between us and those who come to salah while they are drunk? Now he didn't say until you know what you are reciting. It's until you understand what you are reciting. Understanding what we recite will completely transform your salah. I mean, it's obvious. If someone knows the tafsir of Surat Al-Asr, and someone else is reciting Surah Al-Asr because it's the shortest surah in the Quran, the quality of the two salat is going to be completely different. Right? So what happens to many of us? We pray, number one, we pray the shortest surahs. Number two, we don't ever think in our lives, no, what is Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la? What does it mean? Or maybe, or maybe we learn the translation in school, but we even learn the translation in a parrot fashion where we never thought about it. Right? We know Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen, all praise to Allah, the Lord of the universe. What does that even mean? If you ask a child, what does that mean? Most of the children who are memorizing that, even they don't even understand the English. The English that you are telling them, they don't understand. You know, I have a book about Surah Fatiha by Ibn al-Qaim al rahimahullah, which is 1,000 pages. 1,000 page tafsir of Surah Fatiha. We don't even know the translation. Those of you who follow my Radio Al Ansar Tafsir program know that we spent eight hours on Surah Fatiha. Two months. The entire October and November went in Surah Fatiha. That's how deep the Surah goes. But we don't understand it. And if you don't understand your Salah, it's going to affect. I mean, let's think about something simple, a simple part of the Salah. Why do we start the Salah with Allahu Akbar? Why not with Alhamdulillah or Subhanallah or La ilaha illallah? Why Allahu Akbar? What does Allahu Akbar mean? Anyone? What does Allahu Akbar mean? Come on, we learned this in school. Allah is the greatest. You know, we talk about propaganda videos. I was watching a 
anti-Islamic video. They showed the Muslims going takbir and they had subtitles. Takfir, get to the infidels. You see how they walk things around. <laughs> so be careful with these things. Right? This is the tricks of the media. And the Muslim forward it to me saying, look at these Muslims making takfir. Making takfir, they're saying takbir. I mean, we don't even, we see the subtitles, we don't even listen carefully, you know, what's the guy actually saying? So, what's Allah? Akbar? Allah is the greatest. Why start Salah by saying Allah is the greatest? Because you are psychologically preparing yourself to talk to Allah. You are telling yourself Allah is the greatest. So I will concentrate on Allah. I will speak to Allah. I will worship Allah for the next 5 to 10 minutes. But when we say Allah Akbar, and then we're thinking about our business, are we thinking about the television? Are we thinking about the kitchen? Are we thinking about everything else? Is Allah really, really the greatest priority in our lives? Is it? You see, we don't understand what Allahu Akbar, how will it have this effect on us? How will we really say Allahu Akbar from the heart when we start our salah? And that's just two words. That's just the impact of understanding these two words and how it can change your salah. What about Surah Al-Asr? Most of us like reciting Surah Al-Asr in our Salah because it's two lines. Imam Ash-Shafi said that if only Surah Al-Asr was revealed, it would have been sufficient for the guidance of mankind. Do we even know what Surah Al-Asr means? By time, verily mankind is headed for destruction, except those who believe and do righteous deeds and help each other, help each other towards the truth and help each other to remain patient help each other to remain patient. This surah gives us the recipe for surviving this dunya. You want to survive this dunya? Do four things. Believe, do good deeds, do the dawah, work together towards spreading the truth, and be patient. Think about it. You can sit and think about Surah Al-Asr for hours. Entire books have been written on Surah Al-Asr. So someone who understands the tafsir of Surah Al-Asr, won't their salah be different? from the person who just recited it because it's short. Same with Surah Al-Ikhlas. Surah Al-Ikhlas, many of us know this, is supposed to be equal to one-third of the Qur'an. Right? But we take it the wrong way. What do we do? Kullu Allah wahad, we say it three times. We say, I recited the entire Qur'an. Have you ever seen people do this? They recite Surah Al-Ikhlas three times, and they say, I got the reward of reciting the entire Qur'an. You didn't. You didn't get the reward of reciting the entire Qur'an because you missed the point of Surah Ikhlas and you missed the meaning of Surah Ikhlas and you don't understand Surah Ikhlas. So how can that get you the reward of the entire Qur'an? When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that Surah Ikhlas is equal to one-third of the Qur'an, he is telling us that the message of Surah Ikhlas is the message of Tawheed. And one-third of the Qur'an speaks about Tawheed. So if you understand Surah Ikhlas, you will understand one-third of the Qur'an. You'll understand the oneness of Allah. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Say God is one and only. There's only one God. There's only one creator who is unique. This is the message of one-third of the Qur'an. Focuses on this message. Right? This is what Rasulullah Islam is telling us. Allah who summit. Allah is above everything else. Everything else rises towards Him. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He doesn't have children. And know that is He the child of anyone. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And there's nothing like him. If you read the Qur'an, you realize that this same message is repeated throughout one-third of the Qur'an. So you have the one-third of the Qur'an's message in your hands. And what do we do every time we read Salah? قُلْ لَوْ هَدَ اللَّهُ سَمَدْ لَمْ يَلِي وَلَمْ يُلَدْ We say it so fast without tajweed. I don't even know sometimes if the Salah is accepted. Now if you understand the Surah, it will transform your life. It will transform your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you are talking about Allah. You are talking about His names and attributes. And that's how we increase our love of Allah. By understanding these things. So these are three examples of how understanding the Qur'an, and understanding the dhikrs, the words of remembrance which we say in our salah, will transform our salah. And there's two ways to do this. The best way is to learn Arabic. Right? That's why the early generations, whenever they conquer the country, they never translated the Qur'an. You never heard of the Sahaba translating the Qur'an into the language of the people of Egypt, or the people of Syria, or the people of Iraq. No? Right till today, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, what language do the people speak there? Arabic. They didn't speak Arabic at the time of the Sahaba. 
He didn't speak Arabic. The Sahaba went there, instead of translating the Quran, they taught the people Arabic. And the scholars of the past, like Imam Shafi, Rahimahullah, Ibn Taymiyyah, and many others, they regarded Arabic as compulsory for every Muslim. Imam Shafi, Rahimullah, says, how can Arabic not be compulsory when your Salah is in Arabic, your Quran is in Arabic, the Hadith are in Arabic, your Dua is in Arabic, the Azan is in Arabic, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Inshallah, all of this is Arabic. So how can you not be compulsory to understand Arabic? So learning Arabic is vital for understanding the Quran. If you learn Arabic, complete transformation in your Salah. But of course, not all of us can learn Arabic in a short period of time. So how then do we get this while we're still studying Arabic? Learn the translation. Right? Learn translations. Again, translations is not on the same level. It won't give you the same deep understanding of the Quran. But learning a translation will at least give you the message of the surah. And if you got the message of the surah, it will be easier to understand the surah and to benefit from the surah. So let's begin by learning translations, inshallah, and with that, you know, working towards learning Arabic, inshallah. So point number one was to clarify our intentions. Point number two was, anyone can tell me what point number two? Understand what you are reciting. Understand it. And that takes us to point number three, which is a branch of point number two. Where that is, understand Surah Fatiha. Why Surah Fatiha specifically? You recite it in every raka. I want you to think about something for a while. Think about this. There are 114 surahs in the Quran. Right? There are 114 surahs in the Quran. Why did Allah choose Surah Fatiha to be the only surah which we recite in every single rak'ah of the salah? Why? It's not a coincidence. And I said, Allah, whatever He does, there's hikmah behind it. So to choose this surah to be the only surah which we recite every day 17 times minimum. Really, we recite it minimum 17 times. Two in Fajr, four in Zuhr, four in Asr, three in Maghrib, four in Isha. Do the max, 17. If you're praying your Witr and your Sunnah, it's more. Why? How many of us, I mean, you know, it makes me sad. Because when you learn about Surah Fatiha, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam referred to it as the greatest Surah in the Quran. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about it, that a door from Jannah has opened, which has never been opened before. For Surah Fatiha and the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. Rasulullah Sallallahu said that nothing like it has been revealed in the Torah or the Gospel or the Quran. That's powerful, meaning nothing like Surah Fatiha was revealed to any of the Prophets. To any of the Prophets. And what do we do with this Surah? Which Rasulullah Sallallahu had touched the highest level of greatness? We recite it so fast that we don't even know what we are saying. And we just go, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Malik, Yawmidin. We disrespect the surah. And we lose the entire purpose of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that La salata illa bi fatiha til kitab. There is no salah. Without Surah Fatiha, there is no salah. So Surah Fatiha is crucial. In another hadith, he called Surah Fatiha the salah. One of the names of Surah Fatiha is the Salah. So this is why I'm focusing on Surah Fatiha. Because when you understand Surah Fatiha personally, when I learned the tafsir of Surah Fatiha, it changed my life forever. It literally changed my life forever. What is Surah Fatiha? Surah Fatiha is divided into two parts. The first part, the first four verses, teaches us again about Tawheed. It teaches us who Allah is. He is the Rabb of the universe, the Lord of the universe. He is most merciful. He is the King of the Day of Judgment. And He is the one who we worship alone, and who we ask help from alone. Each of these four verses, uh, on Radio al Ansar, I spoke about each of these four verses for one hour each. Right? Because that's how deep these verses are. What is a Rabb? What is the meaning of Rabb? Rabbul Alameen. How should it impact our life? What are the qualities of a Rabb? Do we think about that? What's meant by Allah's mercy? How is His mercy manifest in our lives? How do we show mercy to others? 
what should the impact in our lives be knowing that Allah is the King of the Day of Judgment? When you recite that verse, shouldn't you feel the fear of the Day of Judgment when you stand before Him? When there's no other kings, there's no presidents, there's no nothing besides Allah. He's the one who you'll be answerable to. When we say we alo Allah alone, we say to Allah, you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. This is the ultimate message of Tawheed. And then we go out and we ask other people for help with things which only Allah can help us. And we worship our money and we worship our desires and other things. Really ponder over these four verses. Study the tafsir of these four verses. They will transform your life. These verses focus on Allah's most important names and attributes. And then through the wasila of those names and attributes, we make a dua. What is the dua? The single most important dua in your life. And we make this dua every day. We don't even know we're making dua. How many of us even know that Surah Fatiha is a dua? It's a dua that we're supposed to make every day. Why do we say Amin after Surah Fatiha? Why do we say Amin? Because it's a dua. It's a dua. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. A question a lot of Muslims ask is that we are already Muslims. Why are we asking for guidance? Anyone here wants to try answering that? Why would a Muslim need to ask for guidance 17 times a day? Anyone got answers? Seriously. Can any of us say that we are 100% right on every issue of the deen? On every issue of difference of opinion, we know what's the right opinion. We're following the right opinion. On every issue of aqidah, we have the right aqidah. When people are debating whether something's a bidah or not, we're following the right opinion. Are we perfect Muslims where we don't make any sense? No, we all need Allah's guidance at every second of the day. We ask Allah to guide us in those issues of fiqh where we might be following the wrong opinion. We ask Allah to guide us in issues of aqidah where we might have the wrong belief and we don't even know we have the wrong belief. How many Muslims follow the wrong beliefs thinking it's the beliefs of Islam? Meanwhile, they are following beliefs which have been imported from Hinduism and Christianity and everywhere else. We ask Allah to guide us in areas where we are weak and we are committing sins. To guide us to step away from those sins and become better Muslims. This dua is the difference between Jannah and Jahannam. It's the difference as to whether we will be successful in this life or not. This dua, ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Really, we shouldn't just make this dua. Because when you're reciting Surah Fatiha, you shouldn't be saying this. You should be making this as a dua. And we should be crying and making this dua. I remember when I first studied the tafsir of Surah Fatiha, personal story, but I'll mention it anyway. I was a teenager. Right? I was a teenager. And I was very confused because a lot of different Muslim sects and groups were telling me that we are right and everybody else is wrong. We the same sect, everybody else is deviant. And the teenager, I had no clue who's right, who's wrong. You know what I used to do? I used to go by the Kaaba. I was in Makkah at the time with Umrah. I used to go sit in the Hatim by the Kaaba and just make one dua. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. I used to make Surah Fatiha, recite Surah Fatiha as a dua over and over again. Why this dua? Because they're asking Allah for guidance. And I truly believe any human being who asks Allah for guidance sincerely will be guided to the straight path. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, He guides those who seek guidance. That's why we find that there are Christians and atheists and Jews and Hindus who have become better Muslims than we are. Because they asked Allah for guidance. While many of us, we take Islam for granted. We've never once asked Allah for guidance. We sit on our high horse and say, I'm right. Everybody else is wrong. Without even thinking that there's a possibility I might be wrong as well. Right? So those who ask Allah for guidance, they're the ones who Allah will guide. So Surah Fatiha is so important. I want to mention one last hadith about Surah Fatiha and then I'll go into the final point of this lecture and then we'll break for Q&A and end off there, inshallah. This final point of Surah Fatiha is personally my favorite hadith. You know, there are a lot of beautiful hadith, but this is my favorite hadith because it transformed my salah. And this hadith is a hadith Qudsi, which means, what's hadith Qudsi? Anyone knows? It's from Allah. We're talking about the words of Allah. 
Rasulullah sallallahu said that Allah said, Allah said, I have divided the salah between me and my servant. I have divided the salah, and salah in this hadith refers to Surah Fatiha. I have divided the Surah Fatiha which you recite in the salah, Allah said, I have divided it between me and my servant. When you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah replies, Hamidani Abdi. When you say all praises to Allah, the Lord of the universe, Allah replies to you. And He says, my slave has praised me. When you say, Ar-Rahmani Rahim, Allah replies to you. And He says, that my slave is declaring my glory. When you say, Maliki Yawmidin, again Allah replies to you. When you say, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, you alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. When you say that sincerely with understanding, Allah replies, my slave will have whatever he asks for. He said, this is between me and my slave. He'll have or she'll have whatever she asks for. And what do you ask for straight away after that verse? mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. When do you ask that? Immediately after Allah says that you're going to have whatever you ask for. And then you ask Allah for guidance. Tell me that dua won't be accepted. Now tell me this hadith won't transform your salah. When you sing Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen in the salah, Think about the fact that Allah is listening to you and responding to you. And He is saying, Hamidani Abdi. Think about that in the Salah. When you are talking about Iyaka Nabudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, think about the fact that Allah is now telling you, He is now telling you, you'll have whatever you ask for. And then make the dua for guidance from the heart. This will change Salah completely. It becomes another level altogether. Because now you are sincerely talking to Allah and Allah is replying to you while you are talking to Allah. So that's Surah Fatiha. And that brings us to the final point. The final point regarding Salah. The most important part of the Salah. Can anyone tell me what is the most important part of the Salah? The Sajda. The Sajda. That's why we have one Qiyam, one Ruku, but two Sajdas. Rasulullah told us, Akrabu ma yakun al-abdu min rabbihi wa huwa sajid. This is Zahi Muslim. The closest that a servant will be to their Lord is while they are in sajda. The closest you are to Allah is when you are in sajda. Why? Because this is the ultimate act of humility. That, Ya Allah, I will put my face on the dirt, on the ground for you, but not for anybody else. In sajda is where the sweetness of salah is tasted. That's where salah can become the coolness of your eyes. That's when you are closest to Allah. And you need to stay in sajda long enough to feel close to Allah. If you're just picking the ground, you're not going to feel it. You're not going to feel close to Allah. You need to stay there and think about the fact that this is when I'm closest to Allah. And feel Allah's love into your heart. Feel Allah into your heart. Feel Him in your life. This is done in the sajda. And what is the most important thing to do in sajda? And this is something many of us don't even know. For many of us, all we know is, we go down, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. I don't, know, I don't even know if you say it three times at that speed, right? And we back up again. That's the beginning. That's the introduction to the sajda. That's praising Allah. What would Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi do in his sajda? <coughs> hmm? Anyone knows? What would Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi do in his sajda? Dua, that's the time when you are closest to your Lord. So that's the time when your du'as are accepted. How many of us even make du'a at that time? The time when du'as are accepted, how many of us do it? That's why he was in sajda for so long that people had to touch his feet to see if he's still alive. He's making du'a upon du'a, knowing that he's closest to his Lord. And this is when the du'as are accepted. Ibn al-Qaim al rahimahullah, in his book Zad al-Ma'ad says there are seven places in the salah where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to make dua but most of his dua was in the sajda. You know many a times there's a saying which goes that bid'ah kills sunnah. When we introduce a bid'ah to the religion it kills the sunnah, right? And in our communities we have this innovative practice that after the salah we have a congregational du'a. We made it a must. We made it, in many masjids, regarded as compulsory. 
even though Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never did it in his, in his life as far as I know. Right? We made it a must though. So we will do that without, I mean most of the people in the masjid are biting their nails or looking at their watches or looking for a gap behind them to run out after the dua is over. Some are walking like that and putting their, we don't even doing it in a proper way anyway. But the sunnah dua of sajda, we don't even know it exists. Think about it, many of us don't even know it exists that you need to make dua in, this, uh, in the sajda. That's it, that's the most important part. If you make dua in your sajda, you have fulfilled the purpose of the salah. Because when you are reciting the Quran and you are understanding it, that's Allah talking to you. And when you put your head on the ground for the sake of Allah and you are making dua, that is you talking to Allah. And so when you make a sajda properly, you have truly conversed with Allah. You have truly prayed a salah. Now if you pray your salah like this, with understanding, slowly, understanding Surah Fatiha, understanding the Surah, making dua in the sajda, tell me it's not going to change your life. Tell me it's not going to be enjoyable. Tell me it won't make you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is salah, this is how it's supposed to be prayed. This is how the Sahaba prayed. This is how the Prophets prayed. This is how the righteous people of the past prayed. This is how the righteous people today pray. But for many of us, we have never heard of this. Again, I say it's not our fault. It's the education system which needs to explain why. We need to revamp this. We need to teach this to our children. We need to add this to the syllabus which we teach, wherever we teach. And we need to make this something which we practice upon. So let us revive the sunnah of making dua in the sajda. And with that, we come to the conclusion. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I have personally prepared some questions with, in case nobody asks questions. And when you make dua in salah, is it limited to nafil salah? Okay, good question. Dua in the salah, is it limited to nafil salah? And I think with that comes the question, does it have to be in Arabic? Right? That's, a dua, that's the question, right? Okay, there's three opinions regarding this amongst the scholars. The first opinion, this is the view of the majority of Hanafi scholars locally, is that it has to be in Arabic, right? So if it has to be in Arabic and you can make it in any salah. Uh, the view of some of the scholars who I've studied under is that in the Farl Salah, it has to be in Arabic. And in the Nafil Salah, it can be in any language. The view of the majority of my teachers and my personal opinion is that the dua in the salah, whether in the far salah or nafil salah or sunnah salah, it doesn't matter, the dua can be in any language. The reason is not one of the arkan of the salah. It's not one of the pillars of salah. The pillars of the salah have to be in Arabic. <coughs> the surah fatiha, the zikrs, the Allahu Akbar, all of that has to be in Arabic. But dua is something universal. And Allah accepts dua in any language. And any other time where dua is accepted, you can make dua in English, in Urdu, in any language, right? So the time where you are closest to Allah, why would Allah reserve it only for people who understand Arabic? Right? So based on that, most of my teachers have said that in the salah, everything else must be Arabic. But when you are in sajda making the dua to Allah, it can be in any language. It will not accept, it will, it will not affect the validity of the salah in any way. And the dua can, will be accepted because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all languages, right? Not only Arabic. And even a link to that as well is dua from the Quran because it's haram to recite Quran in the sajda. So what about the duas from the Quran? Like, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Or, Rabbi zidni ilma. That's part of the Quran. That's permissible in the sajda because you are not reciting it as Quran, you are saying it as a dua. Right? So that's also permissible. Allah knows best. Any other questions? Yes? The kunut? Yeah. Okay, you're talking about the dua kunut, which is recited in the witr and in some of the mazhabs in the fajr as well. Right? The kunut, again, there's no limitation to what you can recite in the kunut. Again, it's a time to make dua. It can be any dua. And again, it doesn't have to be in Arabic. It doesn't. The kunu does not have to be in Arabic. What's mentioned there is the dua which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make from his heart. And if you are not making the dua from the heart, you are not making dua. You are just reading a ritual. 
How many of us here have been for Umrah in Ramadan? Raise your hands. In the kunut, do they make just a ritual dua or do they make a lot of dua? Yeah? They make a lot of dua. They make every dua. They make dua for everybody. Right? Why? Because that's the sunnah. That's the sunnah. Kunut, again, is a time when dua is accepted. So you make any dua at that time which you want to make. Right? So this is the purpose of salah, is to make dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not limit it. And Allah knows best. Any more questions? The brother side, any questions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. No, Rasulullah Islam would make dua according to Ibn al in seven different places in the Salah. He would make dua in the Ruku, after standing up from Ruku, in the Sajdas, and in that place that you are mentioning at the end after Tashahud. He would make dua at all of these points. But he says, Ghalib, majority of his dua was in Sajda. Right? So that's the Sunnah. And that is what we will go with, and Allah knows best. Anything else? <coughs> Closing your eyes for concentration is not haram. There's nothing haram about it. Again, the sunnah is to pray with your eyes open. Right? But if someone closes their eyes, it will not affect the validity of their salah in any way. Right? But again, sunnah, concentrate with your eyes open. Because that, that makes you more disciplined. You know, kids are running around and making noise and you're still able to concentrate with your eyes open. That takes you to a very high level of concentration and focus, inshallah. Okay, yes? Yes. Yeah, that's a, you see, there's nothing in the Quran or Hadith are about this. So it's all subject to opinion. So there's three opinions amongst the scholars, and I mentioned all three. No, no, again, it's an issue of opinion amongst the scholars. You follow the scholar who you believe has the strongest evidence, and Allah knows best. Right? Yes. announcement that uh, tomorrow at uh, IDM he is teaching a course on the fiqh of salah at 8 a.m. in the morning. So anyone who wants to learn the fiqh of salah in details can go to IDM tomorrow inshallah. Sheikh Bilal will be teaching a course there. And if we don't have any more questions, I'll do a bit of advertising of my own. <coughs> right? We'll take more questions after this. Uh, or you have a question there? Okay. Yes. You're talking about for women? Okay, uh, again, the local Hanafi view is that a woman's elbow should be on the ground. But if you read the books of Hadith, there's no evidence for this. Yes. Yes. No, if, if you read the books of Hadith, Rasulullah Islam said it's not, you should not, not have your elbows on the ground. And he made it general. He didn't say for men. He made it general. You will not find, in my, in my research, I have not found a single authentic Hadith telling women to put their elbows on the ground. And I challenge people to go and do the research. If you find the hadith and if it's authentic, then I will follow it, inshallah. Right? But I don't know of any hadith on that topic, and Allah knows best. Anything else? Yes? Again, it depends what you mean by difference. For example, many women can't play side by side, right? And a woman has to wear a full hijab, while a man doesn't have to. Wear. But when you're talking about the actual movements, the actual movements of the Salah, then again, the Hanafi view is there's a difference. And the view of the other Madahib, the majority view is that there's no difference. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni asalli. Pray as you've seen me pray. He never said, men pray as you've seen me pray, women pray differently. He just said, pray as you've seen me pray. And if you read the books of Hadith, read any Hadith about Salah, you will not find any hadith where he told any of his wife to do any of the positions differently. Right? So, from a hadith perspective, there, is, there shouldn't be any difference. Right? When the differences began in our history and why this difference came about, I don't know. 
someone has to trace it back historically and find out when, when it came in and why it came in. But if you study the seerah and the books of hadith, there shouldn't be a difference. Allah knows best. Right. Anything else? Surprised nobody asked about the congregational dua thing. Uh, there's a lot of differences of opinion there because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi himself had done it in, in different ways. Right? There wasn't just one way which he made the tashahud, raising the fingers. Sometimes he'd raise it, some hadith he raised it and moved it all the time. So you'll find different people practicing it differently. Right? Uh, the stronger position is that it needs to be raised the entire tashahud, not just at the Ashadu Allah, ilah, ilah, ilah. If you read the hadith, it's raised the entire tashahud. Then there's a difference of opinion. Do you keep it pointed forward or do you move it up and down? There is flexibility because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did both. Right? You'll find hadith for both points of view. So there is flexibility in how you do it. Allah knows best. Okay. Uh, so with that, I'd like to mention for those of you all who don't know, uh, I'm the head tutorial assistant for the Islamic Online University. There's a pamphlet for the Islamic Online University on your desk. Uh, a new semester in our Bachelor's of Arts in Islamic Studies program begins this coming Friday. But registrations remain open until the end of March. For those of you who don't know, the Islamic Online University was founded by my Ustad, Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, in 2007. Today we have over 60,000 students around the world, alhamdulillah, doing our free courses. We have over 2,000 students doing our Bachelor of Arts program. And we have a variety of subjects besides teaching Aqidah and Fiqh and Seerah and Tafsir all online. All online. Besides teaching all of this, we even have psychology from an Islamic perspective, counseling from an Islamic perspective, management from an Islamic perspective, business economics from an Islamic perspective. We have all of these courses as well, which is something new and a field which needs to be developed. And the diploma section is completely free, but the BA program is $60 a semester for South Africans, which works out to what? Very cheap, about 400 rand or 300 rand. Right, a semester for university course in a, a university bachelor of arts program. It's probably the most cheapest BA you'll get in the world. Right? So it's not something which we can't afford, inshallah. It's an opportunity to gain in-depth knowledge of Islam. Four-year program where you will learn Arabic, you will learn Aqidah in details, comparative religion, Dawah techniques, fiqh, history, tafsir, hadith, principles of fiqh, principles of tafsir, principles of hadith. And you learn psychology and counseling and management and business economics and English and computers as well, all taught from an Islamic perspective. So it's a very unique program and something which is very beneficial for anybody who signs up. It doesn't matter what your profession is, what your field is, it takes your Islamic knowledge to an entirely new level. We have 2,000 students, alhamdulillah, doing the BA program, probably more now, and we have 60,000 during the diploma section. So please sign up, you'll have the brochures there. If anybody doesn't have, I have more copies. And my business card is there as well. If you want to contact me or check out the website address, it's all there in my business card, inshallah. I hope to see many of you all online. Also, I have radio programs on Radio Al-Ansar. Tomorrow morning, every Wednesday, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., I have a tafsir program. Tomorrow, we'll be doing the tafsir of Surah Ma'un. Right? And Wednesday evenings from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., we have a dawah program on Radio Al-Ansar. Myself, Shabir Bacha and Mawana Khalid Yaqub, where we discuss dawah issues. So inshallah, you can tune in for that as well, and we can benefit together inshallah. So with that, are there any more questions, or shall we close up now? Okay, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Somebody told me that South Africans, and specifically the people who attend this course or this program, don't ask questions. So I was worried nobody's going to ask questions, but alhamdulillah, you've been a beautiful audience who asked a lot of good questions. Jazakallah for that. It made this much more beneficial for all of us. We ask Allah to make salah the coolness of our eyes, to help us to concentrate in all our salahs, and to help each and every one of us to not only benefit from our salah, but to benefit others with our salah, like our Abu Bakr Siddiq Rajal Anhu used to do. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.